Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Melissa. Um, so we will get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Bernie Daigle, and I currently look after knowledge exchange for the Atlantic Forestry Centre. But uh, before that, uh, I spent about 15 years at, at, as a lab supervisor for the National Tree Seed Centre. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Bernard Daigle, et puis je m'occupe du transfert de connaissances pour le Centre de Foresterie d'Atlantique. Euh, plus tôt de ma carrière, euh, je passe une quinzaine d'années euh, comme superviseur de laboratoire au Centre national de semences forestières. Euh, avant de commencer, euh, j'aimerais souligner quelques remarques d'ordre administratif. Uh, before starting, uh, I'd like to go over, over a few housekeeping uh, notes. Um, as was stated in the email invitation, today's presentation will be in English. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available to participants. Uh, the presentation slides will also be available uh, in both French and English. Uh, tel qu'indiqué dans le courriel d'invitation, cette présentation sera donnée en anglais. Le webinaire sera enregistré et disponible aux participants. Les diapos de la présentation seront aussi disponibles uh, en français et en anglais. Nous vous demandons d'utiliser l'icône de questions-réponses pour poser vos questions. Euh, les questions peuvent être posées soit en anglais ou en français, mais nous allons attendre jusqu'à la fin de la présentation pour répondre aux questions. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A button to uh, ask your questions. Uh, the questions may be asked in English or in French, uh, but we will wait until after the presentation is over to answer all of the questions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the last webinar in our Scaling Up Seed Supply series. Uh, we've had three previous webinars, for those of you who uh, may have uh, been able to catch those. Um, and these are available on YouTube. Um, in the previous webinars, we covered uh, equipment solutions, uh, spring seeding hardwoods, and uh, harvesting of berry crops. And uh, as you know, today's presentation will be on forecasting of fall crops. Um, if you want to view uh, the um, preceding webinars and you have a hard time finding them, uh, just contact uh, the, uh, the Seed Center and uh, we'll uh, get you to where you can, uh, you can find them. Uh, next slide. Before uh, we get started, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are we conduct our work activities on the treaty lands and territory of numerous and diverse Indigenous nations and pay tribute to their heritage and legacy. Uh, we aim to walk lightly, harvest with respect, and learn from local knowledge keepers of every nation. Um, I'll now pass it on to um, our first speaker, um, Donnie McPhee. Uh, Donnie is the uh, coordinator of the National Tree Seed Center, and he will be giving an overview of the Indigenous Seed Collection Program. So Donnie. Hi, thanks, Bernie. Yeah, so first of all, I wanna mention that uh, I'm a substitute here, Mary Knockwood, who has been hired on as our program manager for our Indigenous Seed Collection Program was scheduled to give these little these slides, but uh, the power is out in her region right now. I know people are having a lot of issues between Roger and power outages, but uh, so I'm filling in here. Um, I'm also going to take the opportunity. Um, again, I gave uh, the most of the first three presentations, and this is an opportunity today you're going to meet uh, more of our staff. Um, so I'm just giving these first three slides. Um, Something I had mentioned in the earlier presentations was, I think the first presentation we talked about, the rumors of seed being included in the 2 billion tree program. Well, that is actually going to happen. So seed collecting is going to be part of the program. So there will be funding available for seed collecting. Um, the exact details are being worked out, but uh, expect this fall that calls proposals towards seed collecting will be you know, coming out. Um, so that's why it's really important, I think, these seminars that we're giving, because if we're going to be collecting seed for to support the Tubian Tree Program, we want to make sure it's done right so it's usable in whichever region you currently reside in. The other exciting thing that happened um, just uh, 
three weeks ago is that we actually got our funding for our Indigenous Seed Collection Program through the ADM Innovation Fund. And what that means is that we now have funds for myself, along with other members of our staff to actually get out on the road, coast to coast, uh, meeting not only with Indigenous communities, but also with Parks Canada and other NGOs or organizations that are interested in seed collecting. And maybe they just need uh, you know, a little extra training or someone to bounce ideas off with in the field. So if that interests you, I really strongly encourage you to send us a, a, a message, a note, e email ASAP, letting us know. Um, I myself am driving across the country, leaving in August, and I'll be gone for three months, driving right across the country and on my trip. If you're an Indigenous community or a park or an NGO and I can work it in for you know a half day session, then we'll do our best to make that happen. Uh, but now onto our Indigenous seed collection program. Um, so this is something that uh, we've been working on for a couple of years. It was announced this spring, but it really is to sort of help Indigenous communities that are interested in seed collecting being coming part of the two billion tree program, or maybe it's just for conservation needs of species of concern to them. Um, so basically we got funding to, you know, to help communities get rolling and get started uh, in, on this endeavor. Um, understanding that there's over 600 First Nations uh, communities uh, with over 60 languages, uh, but we wanna take not just, you know, our experiences, but we wanna incorporate the knowledge that all of our indigenous communities have back into some of the methodologies that we, we use. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things that we're looking to do again is provide uh, training either virtual or in person whenever possible. Um, if you are making collections and you maybe you don't have a facility to help with uh, seed processing and storage. That's something that we can work on with you. And the same with testing of uh, seed. And yes, for Lynn, uh, the decks are all available um, to everyone. So um, we'd also be looking to sort of uh, work on memorandum and understanding just to ensure the protection of your seed and your intellectual properties for any seed that does come to the seed center. Again, understanding that we're just here to help you. So if you send seed to us, it's your seed. And hopefully down the road, maybe you have a, a storage facility that becomes available and you may, maybe you want to move your seed to there. But but for now, we just want to be here to, to support your needs. And then the other thing, Mary Knockwood, who again was going to give this presentation, Mary uh, has a great background in finding funding sources. So if you need help uh, potentially with some funding sources, Mary might be able to help you out as well. And the last slide, please. Yeah, and uh, you know, besides um, our road show and, and hitting the road to, to meet up with a lot of communities this fall, um, you know, we're always open uh, to having community members come to the National Tree Seed Center. I know we had a, a program with Ganawaki out of Quebec and they sent two uh, technicians to us who came and spent a week with us. And I know we're looking at doing that again. And there are lots of other communities across the country who are already talking to us about that, about sending technicians to the seed center, you know, spend a week or two um, and see how we do things and then bring that knowledge and help incorporate some of the things maybe they know into what we do, but just a sort of an information exchange. So yeah, I think that's uh, all I'm gonna say on that. And I'm gonna hand it back to Bernie. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks, Donnie. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a bit of an overview of the Seed Center, just, just to, to put the, the Seed Center in perspective. Uh, back in the late 1950s and early 60s, there was a lot of research by CFS scientists on, on tree seed. And this was in support of reforestation efforts by the provinces and industry. The researchers who were working on seed would make their own collections and their own processing of the seed and the expertise that was available and the equipment was that was available uh, varied among the uh, the research groups so this led to a system that was um, a little bit inefficient so in 1967 the uh, national tree seed center was established in Petawawa, ontario and the original mandate of the seed center was to collect to store uh, to process and provide seed of known quality and origin um, for
for research. In 1996, uh, the Seed Center moved to Fredericton, New Brunswick, and this coincided with new commitments from the federal government with the signing of the Con Convention of Bi on Biological Diversity and the Species at Risk Act. So the Seed Center's mandate changed, or, or I should say it grew to include collections for genetic conservation. And a good example here is that in 2004, and that was only two years after the emerald ash borer was discovered in Canada, uh, National Tree Seed Center staff started an ash seed uh, collection program. And that program continues to this day. Um, now, with the announcement of the uh, Two Billion Trees program, we realized that we might be able to play a role and share some of the knowledge uh, that we've gained over 55 years of working with uh, tree seeds. Uh, the webinar uh, series uh, and the webinar today is um, uh, actually funded by the Two Billion Trees program. However, you don't have to be part of the program to partake in the seminars. And, um, Anything that, that you hear here, if, uh, if uh, there's something that you need clarification on, uh, you're, you're most welcome to contact the Seed Center uh, and get some more information. Uh, next slide, please. So um, those of you who might have participated um, or, or watched the first webinar, uh, you heard about the importance of seed source. Um, seed source has always been important, but it's even more so now because of uh, climate change. Uh, using the wrong seed, uh, the wrong seed source, could lead to lower survival uh, or, and, and or decreased growth uh, of the trees that are planted. So if you are planning on collecting seed uh, from tree or, or shrub species and you want them to be part of the Two Billion Trees program, then it's really important that you start georeferencing uh, your seed collection sites. Georeferencing just means getting the, the GPS coordinates so we can know exactly where the, those sites are, uh, not exactly, but the, which ecoregion that they're from. And that's so that the seed can be used in the, in the appropriate uh, locations. The map that you see here uh, shows the range of uh, white spruce across its Canadian range. Uh, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there were many Providence trials um, that were established across the country. Now, Providence trials, uh, for those of you who might not be uh, familiar with the term, uh, are where seed from a given species, in this case, let's say it's white spruce, um, is collected across that species range. And then seedlings are grown and they're planted in various locations across the country. And this is to see how seed collected from different regions or areas, call them sources or, or provenances, uh, would perform under different environmental conditions. Now, when you compare the growth of these trees after 40, 50, sometimes 60 years, uh, it's easy to see the difference between the seed sources. Um, there are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, the trees that are grown from locally collected seed uh, tend to perform better than trees grown from seed that, that were collected from further away. And that just goes to show the genetic variation within species. And that's something that's evolved over thousands of years. And uh, you know, climate change is, is part of that. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we mean by fall crops? Um, in Canada, most of our um, the seed for most of our species actually matures in the fall. We have a few species, um, such as the poplars, the elms, uh, most of our willows, and uh, a few maples that produce their seed uh, in the spring. Uh, we talked about uh, these uh, during our second webinar. That leaves us with the conifers, all of the conifers, the spruces, the pines, hemlocks, firs, larches, um, uh, most of the of the hardwoods, um, most of the maples, uh, birches, elm, uh, not elms, oaks, um, ashes, hickories, and then there's a, a whole uh, range of shrub species as well. Um, 
what's neat with the fall collection is that the window of opportunity is a lot wider than it is uh, during spring. In spring, uh, something like poplars, willows, you might have a few days depending on the weather conditions when you have to be there to collect. Uh, that window of opportunity to collect is much wider um, in the fall. It could go from several weeks to uh, a couple of months, even more with some species, unless you, you get a, a, a severe weather event that's going to knock the, the seed off the trees. And another um, kind of a neat thing that happens is that you can go to one site to collect one species and quickly realize that there are quite a few other species that you could collect uh, at the same place um, on the same day. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So look at some of the factors that affect seed production. Um, and, and, and these are important. Um, the first thing is that the trees have to be sexually mature. And a lot of that depends on the species. Some species can produce seed very early after, let's say, less than 10 years, while whereas other species, it'll take 30, 40, 50 years before they start producing seed. Another factor is that uh, trees don't produce seed every year. Um, reproduction takes a lot of uh, resources from the trees. Um, so you don't typically get good seed crops in successive years. It's usually two to seven years. It, it depends on, on uh, the species, but on other factors as well. Uh, if you look at the graph on the upper right, it gives you uh, an example of uh, good seed crops uh, for two Western species, Douglas fir and interior spruce. And that's ranging from, oh, probably about 35 years. And you can see that there's maybe about 10 peaks there. I'm not, I'm not gonna count them all, but uh, gives you an idea that those good seed crops aren't gonna happen every year. And uh, you have to be ready when uh, they do occur. Um, another important factor is stress. Um, trees often, respond to stress by uh, producing seed. So something like a hot, dry summer um, will often result in good seed crops the following year. Um, last year, there was uh, that heat dome event that happened in um, Western Canada. And uh, this year, I'm told that there's a good seed crop uh, in Western Canada. So uh, it that heat dome may have been a contributing factor in that, uh, just to, to create stress. And when that happens, then all of the, the trees of the species, or say most of those trees will start to, uh, to produce seed. And those are the years that, that you want to be out there and, uh, and collecting. Um, there's other stress factors as well. Uh, insects and diseases can cause stress, uh, physical damage. Um, on, on the trees, a windstorm or, or, or something happening to uh, the roots. Um, also trees in urban in environments are often more stressed, just as it's a harsher environment than, than what trees in um, a natural setting, natural environment would, uh, would have. Um, I remember one year, um, this was in the spring, but it was, um, and, and I, I, I was looking for a poplar at the time, and there wasn't really anything that year, but I was driving down and I saw this one poplar tree that was absolutely loaded with, with catkins. So I stopped and I had a look and quickly realized that uh, the preceding summer, that the summer before, um, they'd widened the ditch and actually damaged the roots um, of that poplar tree. And that stress uh, likely caused that tree to produce a lot of seed. Now that shows, or that's an example of a situation where you should not be collecting from that tree because a single tree, um, and there's a lot of other poplar around is not what you want to collect seed from. Um, you need those good 
um, seed years where there's lots of pollen and uh, a good chance for fertilization to occur to, to get good quality seed. Um, okay, next uh, slide. So what are some tips that we can use to help us predict what might be coming up, um, let's say, the next year or, uh, yeah, next year or, or even this year? Uh, we can start, we don't, we don't have to start in the spring of that year. We can actually start looking and observing um, the previous fall. Um, look for something like male catkins. Uh, the image on the left there shows, um, I believe that is uh, speckled alder. Uh, you can see that the, the big male uh, strobili or, uh, or catkins. And if you look to the left on top there at about 10 o'clock, you can see a couple of the, uh, the female catkins. They're much smaller, but once these catkins start shedding their pollen in the spring, um, that's where the, the, the fertilization will occur. So look for heavy um, male pollen cones or catkins or strobili uh, on birches and, and alders and, and other species. Um, another indicator would be uh, conelets on, on pine, that, that image in the middle. Um, most species, the reproductive cycle goes, runs one year. With the pines, it's actually two years. So that first year, um, the pine will produce these conelets, and they'll just stay like that, and they'll resume their growth the following year. Um, so it takes two years. I, I think it's actually about 26 months for that whole reproductive cycle in, uh, in the pines. Now, even though you have conelets, doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to have a crop because there's still a lot of factors that can influence a crop. Um, something else to look for are reproductive buds. Um, some species, it's really, really difficult, if not almost impossible, to distinguish the reproductive from the vegetative buds. But something like... Um, red maple here, uh, you can easily see that there's going to be a, a crop uh, or that there's going to be flowers the following uh, spring just by, by looking at the buds. Um, yeah, uh, next slide. Of course, um, in the spring, you start looking for the flowers and um, flowers are a good indicator. Um, you get sugar maple here. Um, just loaded with, with flowers. If everything goes well, you would get a very good uh, crop of uh, maple seed. Um, pollen uh, production uh, on the right, get some pollen cones on, uh, on jack pine. Um, you, get, you usually get some pollen every year, but when you get a really, really heavy uh, pollen crop, it's, it's usually a good indicator that something could be happening. Um, I think a species that everybody's familiar with, or a couple of species everybody's familiar with, would be the like pin cherry and choke cherry. Um, each spring, we usually see loads of flowers on um, on those species, but it's only every few years that those actually develop into um, uh, a seed crop or a, a fruit. Uh, crop because either pollination, the weather's wrong, uh, a whole bunch of factors can, um, can influence that. And uh, the next slide. So um, getting on to summer, um, you just start seeing how things are uh, developing. Um, on the far left there, there's some um, black cherry, uh, not ready to collect yet. You want those, all of those berries to be ripe before you, you even start thinking of uh, doing a collection. Uh, some white pine cones, those guys are getting pretty close. Um, the one on the right, um, and, and this is where even though things look good early on, it doesn't necessarily mean that the crop is going to develop and you're going to have something worth collecting. Um, <clears throat> I've often seen 
in the spring seeing conelets on, on I'll, I'll, I'll use pine as an example, and they start elongating, they're a nice green color, and all of a sudden they start changing color, they start shriveling up, and then uh, the whole thing or most of them fall to the ground. Uh, this case here um, is due to a cone beetle. If you look at um, up on the upper uh, half of the of the cone there, you can see an exit hole where the uh, the insect left. So uh, um, all this to say that you need to be um, constantly looking for signs and, and monitoring and, and observing, um, but it's good to know what might be possible as you move forward. And I think that's it for me. I'll uh, pass it on to Jacob. And Jacob is going to take us through the actual time of uh, collection and, and, and talk about some specifics there. So all yours, Jacob. Okay. Thanks, Bernie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jacob Billings. I'm a tech with the National Tree Seed Center. And today we're going to be talking about equipment and collection techniques used for fall crop seed collecting. So uh, let's get into it. So what are you going to need for collecting wild seed? Um, you're going to need time, maps and or data and people or network. So, you know, Bernie just went over uh, scouting and obviously scouting for viable populations is going to be very time and resource intensive. So use the network that you have, you know, the network of local experts, staff and friends to help to expand your geographical collection radius. So help you to get outside of where you'd normally collect. Um, so also plan efficient methods of collection. So this includes making a trip plan and uh, thinking about the logistics of multi-day seed storage, having a general route for navigation and uh, yeah, making maps as well uh, that can overlay your seed source data so you can see where your gaps are in provenance. Um, again, this is something that you can use or share with your network. Um, so obviously, even just going out and collecting isn't something that you do in a day. Uh, it takes multiple days or even weeks. So seed ripeness is equal to environmental factors times genetics. Uh, so an example of this is, you know, you could have two trees that are very close together to each other, uh, you know, 50 meters down the road, they're in the same environmental stimulus. Because of genetic variation, uh, they one of those trees will have ripe seed that's ready to be picked, but the other one will have uh, seed that isn't quite ready. It's going to be a week to two weeks before it's, it's ready to be picked. So in that instance, what you want to do is flag that tree, get the geographical coordinates, and keep coming back. Uh, do your cut test, assess for viability, and then collect when it's ready. Because if you do collect too early, it can negatively impact germination viability. Uh, and that's kind of the name of the game. And that's what we're talking about here today. And that's why we're doing this. So uh, yeah, don't collect too early. Uh, next slide, please. So what else are you gonna need for collecting wild seed? Uh, you're gonna need some basic equipment. Since we've already had uh, webinars and we've talked about this before, we've talked about um, uh, equipment solutions for scaling up seed supply. We're not gonna get into too much detail on this today, but if you do have questions, uh, bring it up at the end of this webinar and we'll, we'd be happy to ask. But this list is basically what we're always going to bring out with us uh, in the field for fall collections. Um, yeah, so now we're going to talk a little bit about, ooh, where's my mouse, uh, cut testing. So cut testing is an important technique for seed health and ripeness assessments, as well as for seed forecasting, which Bernie was talking about. Um, the first step in a seed collection should always be to evaluate the seed on the tree you are about to pick from. To do this, we take a few small samples, uh, seed samples from multiple locations on the tree and observe the physical characteristics of the seed. Cut testing can show the overall health and stage of development of the embryo, which is the biggest indicator of germination viability. Cut testing can also aid in revealing decay and parasitism that is not evident by observing the outside of the seed. So what you see can be deceiving. Cut tests can reveal how healthy the seed really is. Um, so when we're talking about cut testing conifers, you can see in the top right of this slide here, we've got you know what almost looks to be uh, two tools. One of them looks like a pizza cutter attached to a cutting board and the other one looks like a machete. So, uh, 
essentially what these are, they're tools that we bring with us that uh, are used specifically for cut testing conifers. The reason why they're so heavy duty is because cones can be quite densely packed. So we need tools that kind of pack a punch that can easily cut through them. Um, so one thing that differentiates doing cut tests on cones versus hardwoods is that with cones, you can expect to find multiple seeds per cone, whereas hardwoods, usually, not always, but usually you expect to find one seed per unit. Uh, so this table here kind of outlies, you know, for example, with Douglas fir, during a half cut test, you would expect to find five seeds in a um, healthy, viable cone. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to the next slide. Again, so cut testing hardwoods now, it's kind of important to reiterate that cut testing, we're always doing it for the same reason, whether it's hardwoods or conifers, is to assess the health and viability of the seed. So in the top left photo here, you can see a tool we're using. Actually, what that is, it's called a PVC pipe cutter. You know, you can get it at any home hardware or any local hardware store. Um, but this is just an example of, you know, a tool that we use that's not necessarily used for its uh, natural purpose, but it works really well in the field for cutting bigger uh, acorn and nut type species. Um, at the top, you can see another tool. Those are our hand pruners with the red handles. Uh, you know, this is what we use most of the time for cutting hardwoods, doing cut tests on hardwoods. But sometimes we do use a knife as well, but we try to steer clear of a knife just because it's a little bit more dangerous. Uh, we recommend if people are looking for the best tool to get for uh, cut testing that you go out and get yourself a pair of hand pruners up top. Uh, you can see some pictures here. So in the bottom left, we've got bitternut hickory, that kind of white coconutty fleshy material. Uh, that's what you're looking for. That's indicative of healthy seed. That Those are indicators of uh, healthy embryonic material in the seed. And that in the same photo, you can see uh, one of them is cut open that looks rotten in the middle. Um, you know, that's what you can't see from the outside, but we're looking to avoid and we're looking to assess. Uh, right next to that, you've got a picture of some sugar maple seeds. So on the left, there's a seed that's been parasitized. And on the right, you've got some healthy looking seeds. So these are all just examples of what you can find, good versus bad. Um, Finally, on the bottom right here, we've got a picture of a tulip tree and some seeds in that fruit. So we have that in there to kind of give an example of uh, an exception to the rule I mentioned earlier about hardwoods having one seed per unit. Uh, as you can see with all the other pictures, that is the case, but with tulip tree, it's an example of um, having multiple seeds per fruit. But uh, yeah, moving forward, I guess. Yeah, next slide. Um, so now we're going to talk about some collection techniques. Uh, so ground collections, you can literally just pick up seeds off the ground sometimes. So these are almost always going to be bulk collections. And what I mean by this is a bulk collection means that all the seeds you've collected are from an unknown number of parent trees uh, versus a single tree collection, which means that the seeds that you've collected are from one uh, single tree and you can guarantee their genetic lineage. So you're going to want to look for squirrel caches. I know this sounds funny, but squirrels naturally uh, hide sources of seeds for their winter consumption. So we can take a little bit from these. Uh, the important thing to remember is whenever you're uh, picking up seeds and, and collecting them from the ground, you want to do cut tests. Really, you, no matter what the collection technique is, you're going to want to do cut tests, but it's, it's more overly relevant for picking them up off the ground because it's more prone to parasitism. Um, so also you want it to, yeah, leave some for the animal and also watch out for mixed species collections. So obviously a squirrel's not gonna care if it collects red and white oak, but you do if you're making a collection. So learn to differentiate between the two and be aware that that could be the case. Um, also in the bottom right photo here, we've got a picture of uh, rollers. These are just specialized equipment for collecting nuts and uh, acorn species from the ground. They work really well, but again, we're gonna share a, or we already have shared, but we will again, a document that outlines all this equipment and uh, where you can buy it and how it's used. Uh, but other ways you can collect seeds off the ground are by raking and uh, picking them up with your hands, just hand picking and putting down a uh, tarp. Next slide, please. So hand stripping. Uh, 
this is good for trees that you can actually reach from the ground, obviously. And it's nice because it has low impact on the tree. You don't need to cut. Um, so if you can't reach the branches from the ground, but you almost can, you can use a pole hook uh, or a hook stick, which is pictured here on the left. So basically it's, it's really cheap to build and, and easy to get a hold of. Um, essentially it's a, you can use it to grab a branch that's just out of reach, pull it down in front of you. And on the other end, there's a carabiner, which you can use to attach to your person. You know, I usually put it on my belt loop and then all of a sudden I'm picking hands free again. And uh, again, low impact because I'm not cutting and you're usually picking directly into a designated collection bucket, like in the bottom right photo here. Uh, let's move on. So pole pruning, this is definitely the most common collection technique we use at the NTSC. Uh, the number one thing is safety gear. So when you're pole pruning branches, it's usually directly above you. So uh, there's high likelihood that these branches could fall on you or very close to you. So make sure to get some head and eye protection. We usually recommend people get uh, or look for climbing helmets because they have both of those built in the one. They have eye protection. So most people aren't great at orientating uh, pole pruners after they've been stacked four or five high. It just becomes very difficult. So. Uh, you're going to want to look for alternative collection methods if that becomes the case, if it's, if it's a little bit too high. Um, you're always going to want to cut at the base of the branch. This is so the tree can heal uh, more effectively, which is better for the tree and better for you. So you can come back in, in later years to collect seed again. And again, uh, when doing this technique, you're always going to want to put down a tarp at the base of where you're collecting. Because when you're collecting, hopefully you're collecting at the right time, seeds are ripe. And when seeds are ripe, they will very easily come off their stalks and stems. So just cutting it and having it fall to the ground will knock off a lot of the seed, uh, actually just from the wind when it's in the air. So laying down a tarp can help minimize that loss uh, when collecting seed. Let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, so ladders, lifts, and bucket trucks. So this... Uh, is obviously two techniques that are taking you up off the ground. Uh, they're highly effective, especially for conifer species because that are hard to climb um, or get up into because they're so thick. Um, obviously you can circle your way around the tree. You can almost strip it. Again, it's low impact because it's usually hand picking with no cutting. Uh, the only thing is obviously it's potentially dangerous. So adhere to your organization's safety regulations when doing this and you know, read up on the actual safety regulations and instructions on the equipment that you're using. Um, you don't want to fall, so uh, yeah, next slide. So felling trees as a method of collection. Uh, this isn't something that typically we recommend people go out and do, you know, we're, it kind of goes against what, <laughs> what we're trying to do here at, with these webinars and at the NTSC, but the NTC only collects from felled trees that are already being cut down for other reasons. So we, we view it as an opportunistic collection. Um, as an example of this, uh, a colleague and I went out to Stewiak, Nova Scotia to collect hemlock cones from a hemlock stand that had already been decidedly, like it was going to be cut down um, to mitigate the spread of hemlock woolly adelegid. So we went ahead of the, uh, time it was going to be cut down and we went with an arborist or two arborists actually. Uh, we went in, the arborist would climb the trees, they would fell giant branches and we would strip those branches from the base of uh, the tree. And this was great. We got very large collections um, and it made us feel like we were getting the best of a bad situation. These trees were already destined to get cut down but we were able to preserve uh, you know, their genetic line and, and hopefully plant those. Uh, climbing. So aboricultural climbing, obviously this requires training. It's a great technique for tall dominant crowns in wild stands. You know, if you can't get in with a lot of tools, sometimes you can bring some climbing gear, but as fun and effective as this is, I would suggest that if you only need to do this once or twice, maybe a year, you're probably better off hiring an arborist to do this for you. That's, you know, they've had a lot more training than you're probably gonna get and they're better at it because they've had more experience. Um, and, you know, we have arborists all over the country. They're in every city. Uh, so they're definitely for hire for this purpose. But if you insist on getting trained, uh, reach out to your local arborist companies and colleges, there are ways of getting trained. Um, but again, this is just another collection technique to think about. Um, next slide. 
So finally, we're going to talk about recording seed source. So you have collected your seed, but what's the next step? You have it in the bag. Uh, you're going to want to record uh, your seed source. So your species that you've collected, the location or provenance, the name of the collectors, the name of the organization that you work for, the project that you're a part of, uh, the date of the collection, whether it's a single or bulk collection, like we talked about before, um, and the GPS coordinates. So another recommendation we have uh, is that you take pictures of absolutely everything. So this is good for you for building your uh, reference points as a seed collector. And it's also good for your network. You know, a picture tells a thousand words. So uh, instead of trying to ask someone a question about what you're seeing or, you know, thinking about, you know, I wanted to know what that species looked like in uh, the spring of, of this year because I'm going out the scout this year. Um, you know, use the pictures that you took from last year and use that in your network. Um, it's, uh, it's a great resource. So take pictures of everything when it goes right and when it goes wrong because they're both learning opportunities. Um, can't stress that enough. So uh, moving on, I think that's it for me. I'm going to pass it off to Kieran Volk. That's going to talk about the step after this. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, yeah, so as Jacob said, you've collected your seeds. Uh, you've, you've labeled them with the proper information. Um, now what do you do? Uh, so we want to be able to transport our seeds either from where they're collecting to the nursery or the greenhouse or the processing facility of our choice. Uh, and as, as both Jacob and Bernie were talking, uh, some days this might be a multi-day trip. So you can't get the seeds um, from the collection area straight to uh, your processing facility. So we want to preserve the viability of the seed throughout that. And the, what we have to do to do that is to reduce moisture and reduce heat. Uh, and we do that by keeping it in paper bags. Uh, moisture can escape in paper bags. The seed can slowly dry in paper bags. Um, and uh, we want to we want to keep those paper bags open as well as much as we can. So we don't necessarily want to keep it in the back of our trucks uh, where it could get hot. Uh, and we want to open those bags up and maybe give them a stir every once in a while just to reduce as much heat uh, and and reduce the amount of moisture. Um, an example of this is uh, I was collecting with uh, another member of the NTSC and. We, uh, we collected a little bit in the rain, so uh, we had some, some yellow birch that was wet, and what we actually did is we, we brought it into our hotel room and opened up the bags uh, and just let them air dry to release as much moisture as we could. Here's some examples of some racks that you can use to, to dry down uh, temporarily before shipping uh, those, those seeds to other areas. There's also research into... Uh, checking like weighing the, those cones and weighing uh, some of those seeds uh, when they're collected versus after drying for a while. Um, and you can do some more research on the individual species that you're collecting. Uh, and if you see that weight stabilizing, that means it's dried down to a, a good level where you can ship it. Because during shipping, uh, you don't know if it's gonna sit in a warehouse somewhere uh, so you, again, we want to reduce that moisture. We want to reduce that heat buildup so that the viability of the seeds uh, stay up. Uh, and if you have any further questions about your specific species that you're interested in transporting, uh, just ask us about it because every species uh, is a little different, whether it's, it's a nut-like species, it's uh, a cone, or if it's a different Samara species. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Melissa. Oh, here's a picture of our drying room in our lab as well. A scaled down version of the big seed centers. Um, yeah. I hope my internet holds out. There's a storm passing through, so my internet's a little shaky, but um, yeah, I'll just, I'll get towards the end here. And uh, as Bernie mentioned, there's been a longstanding uh, ash conservation program with the NTSC. That's definitely how I've gotten my connection. Um, and early experience was doing concentric circles around the GTA through 2008 to about 20. 2018, 2019. Um, so the last major crop year was 2019 through through most of uh, the species ranges, but black ash has been one of the ones that's obviously rising in importance with the threat of amyloid ash borer. It's the most susceptible 
to mortality. And um, I did a recent drive uh, late May from the seed center to to southern Ontario. And, you know, there other than some red maple and heavy crop, there's not a lot of species on the eastern seaboard that I've seen yet at least in the eastern part of the country with heavy crops, but black ash uh, and green ash and white ash. And we're hearing a few other reports of blue ash as well um, being in heavy crop again this year. So um, the areas in red on this map are, are areas that we're going to prioritize for collections because we don't have a single representative GPS um, uh, representation from those areas just yet. And uh, air, any of the areas in, you know, sort of yellowish orange, we have a few, but not quite enough to meet our targets. So if you're in these areas, please let us know. And especially for the Indigenous Collection Program, um, it would be great if your, your community is interested in it. So those are ones where we keep things separate by single tree and we will, all the resources short, shared today would be um, what we would request uh, donations be identified by. So next slide. And um, a, a little bit of new information for those that are involved in the Two Billion Tree Program. Um, obviously, there's three distinct streams in it that are being funded. Underneath the mass planting stream, this is the top species that have been planted as of May 5th. Um, so there's a, a lots more species that have been planted, but these have been sort of the top in demand for the first year. And I'll say in demand, but it's what was available to be planted um, over the last year of the program. So. It shouldn't be surprising to anybody that's involved in reforestation that these have had the most stable seed supply over many years. Donnie may wish to speak to this a little bit, um, but it's interesting that there is one hardwood on there, number 11, Trembling Aspen. And um, yeah, I was recently out at a BC Seed Orchard Association meetings. This is just one of the managers um, with the BC government just beside a grafted, uh, improved, selected white spruce uh, that's in heavy crop in the Okanagan Valley. So Okanagan Valley is not traditionally a place where the species would grow naturally, but um, they manage these orchards and they're they're irrigated to produce the best and most amount of seed um, possible for the seed planting zones they're regulated for. So um, last slide there for our presentation, then we'll open it up. So um, I'm calling it the last poll. For, for those of you that are new, it might be the only poll you've seen, but Anyone else that's attended the rest of our webinars, we were asking lots of questions to see how people were engaging with the Two Billion Tree Program or if you're here for other reasons. Um, as Bernie said, you know, this is the last of our plan dates for the webinars. We're gonna work on our field season and, and work with all the existing programs we have, but um, we will get back into scheduling some more seminars or even just virtual meetings where people can chit chat. So I'm gonna launch a poll here. And if you wanna tell me um, what you're interested in, in hearing about more or what we should plan towards, and if there's other topics that interest you that you think that we could provide some expertise on, please type them in the chat. Um, we will also probably follow up with everyone that's attended all of our webinars um, with a similar sort of ask saying, you know, what do you want to hear the most about? Was it launched? While you're setting that up, Donnie, did you want to speak a bit to the, uh, the list? Good. Well, Mom, Melissa and Kieran are, are figuring that out. Uh, I, I guess with the list of planted trees, as Melissa said, it, it's no surprise because those are the species that our provinces and our forest industries uh, are very well versed in. So there would be a supply of those trees in the initial years of the program. Uh, part of our involvement and our want to do this seminar series and our support um, is some of those other species, um, maybe not the common ones that are currently being planted by our industries and provinces, but based on climate change scenarios might be appropriate for certain regions in the country. So I would expect that over the course of the, the program that we would see a shift in some of the species, uh, depending on appropriate land and ecosystems uh, and where we're looking to plant. But I would expect to see some more hardwoods sort of creeping into those top 10. Okay, and Kieran got Kieran got the poll lots running. Of, so. Lots of responses coming in. This is great. This this poll is very helpful for us. Um, so, if everyone could please answer it, uh, this is what we'll base our our future webinars on. Mm -hmm. For anyone that's involved, especially in the germination testing part, there's already been some indication from some of the the select few of. Uh, facilities that still conduct a lot of seed testing for industry on that. So that might be a, a good combination of folks. And pollen storage and collection. That's very interesting. Yes, we do know some folks that are experts on that, Griffin. And yeah, if you guys have had any questions sort of build up in your head, please uh, type them into the Q&A now and we'll start 
um, and delegating that. We'll, in this give, uh, we're, we'll give 10 more seconds for those eight people who haven't responded. <laughs> and I'm sharing those results now. Perfect. All right. So are we ready to start some Q and A? I'll perhaps give one to Donnie and Mary, and I will say that Mary has been able to join us from her power outage. So Mary, if your internet is stable um, between you and Donnie, uh, I'll start at the bottom. Lynn has a question. Um, when you were speaking about the, oh, sorry, there's a, um, yes, I meant to thank our whole team uh, that's shown on our slide right now, our whole team uh, at the Seed Center. So Bernie is uh, on sort of loan for us and always our knowledge exchange specialist at AFC. And then our uh, our, our full team of folks at the lab and uh, working with out, out extension and outreach. And as uh, Lucy Lavoie, our, our manager, isn't in our photo there, but she's on the line with us today. And yeah, as, as Donnie and Mary pointed out, um, if you if you want to come for a physical visit, please let us know our, our address is there. Um, so yeah, um, there was a couple of comments during the chat that we will be sharing the, the slides and the resources with follow up. Um, we usually just give it about seven to 10 days just to let us find out anything else that people ask that we might need to research. Um, so there's some extra resources at the end on the final slide there, Karen. So there's a number of a lot of English only resources, but there's also some French ones um, for anybody that has French as your first language. And uh, Mary can also speak to more resources in time that are coming along with uh, Indigenous languages included. Um, but I'll get to the first question. So again, Lynn, Lynn said that when speaking about ash seed collection, you, act, you were talking about volunteers. Are there programs to pay First Nations to collect ash seeds or seeds in the eco zones you're focusing on? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't mind taking a, a stab at that. So Lynn, one of the uh, things that actually led to our Indigenous seed collection program was ash. So um, black ash only comes into seed every seven to nine years. And we were getting a lot of uh, requests from Indigenous communities across the nation, um, you know, always wanted to be become part of our ash seed collection program uh, because they were concerned about it. And we would, you know, put money and resources into training people on ash seed collecting specifically, but then it wouldn't be in seed and it wouldn't be in seed and it wouldn't be in seed the next year and the people we train would move on. So it was this never ending cycle of always, you know, looking for funding to help support seed collection, um, but then it not being in seed. So that sort of planted, you know, the seed for our, our Indigenous seed collection program, because if we're doing all this training for ash or for species at risk, well, what about all these other species that if there was another problem, an invasive pest, a pathogen or something, or maybe due to climate change, that particular genetic uh, um, composition of that ecosystem uh, was in jeopardy, that maybe we should start collecting a wider range. So we're really putting the question out to communities and it's gonna change from region to region, what other species are of interest to you? We can do the training and then, you know, hopefully starting to create small to medium sized enterprises with communities in seed collecting. So if you're, you know, maybe you're interested in being part of the ash program, but this year there's a great pine or there's, you know, um, you know, a cherry crop or something like that. So if we can start making collections of those species and getting them in and under the 2 billion tree program, we're hoping there's gonna be a call for all this seed, which would create economic opportunities for those regions. So to dance around your question, no, we do not have specific money set aside for funding for community members to go out and collect ash. But if we can work with you and involve it as part of an overall seed collecting strategy, then there might be opportunities uh, to make a, you know, to, to, to make some money doing such. Hopefully that helps. Perfect. Thanks, Donnie. Uh, Nathan asks, asks, I wonder what solutions you have for seed protection, covers 
or some kind to prevent predation before you can collect? Yeah, so I can, I can start with that, but Bernie or Melissa might want to jump in. And, and I take it, um, you know, there are certain species, you know, I know out west with white bark and limber pine, um, you know, there's bird predation, which is very hard on your collections. And I know like working with Parks Canada, they use actually cages where they actually have to go up and cage the cones um, in the summer so that the uh, nuthatch doesn't um, predate the seed. Uh, we have the same issue here in the east with bur oak, which is a, a rare species where, you know, Bernie had mentioned that there's usually a bigger window of opportunity for collection, but something like bur oak, which is a very palatable, it's, you know, the, the, the seed is actually used by Indigenous communities for making a flower, uh, it's very edible, and it's the day those seed are ripe, you can tell they're ripe because the blue jays and the squirrels are just attacking the trees. Um, so, you know, we have, again, beeches and other species, we have bagged branches and stuff, but it's, it's very expensive when you get into bagging branches and bagging trees. Um, and for those species, we find that, you know, if they are a, of importance and high priority, then we really just have to monitor, monitor, monitor and be ready to go. Um, and I'm not sure if Melissa and Bernie have anything they want to add on that. Uh, I, I just add, if, if you've got a population, they're not all going to come online on the same day. So um, even though you've missed one tree, there's likely going to be some other trees. Uh, the other thing there is that uh, I, I agree with you with the, uh, the bagging and that um, unless it's a really valuable crop and you need uh, a limited number of um, of seed, um, it's it's almost too expensive a proposition to to, to really hit on a large scale. Uh, Melissa, um, yeah, I know there's been some chat about edible crops and the intersection with you know sort of native seed uh, collection and, and whatnot. So I just I know from uh, I did some schooling down in Niagara and, uh, you know, Niagara is a big fruit production region. And there's, there was a lot of emphasis on starting to transition over to more hazelnut production for, for Rocher. And those guys definitely have <laughs> need a lot of tricks to make sure that, that, that they don't attract a massive squirrel population. So I know there was a lot of uh, different techniques for caging and, you know, sort of netting that animals can't completely rip through to protect those hazelnuts. But, you know, when you're in a very, um, settled landscape. Some of those people benefited just from having very minimal habitat around them. So sometimes orchards do this as well, where they put things in places that, um, you know, the predators are just less present. So um, I think that should answer that question fairly well. Hopefully. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Tanis asks, in BC, there are policies around not planting trees that have Sorry, not planting trees that have not been improved through breeding on public lands. Do these policies exist in other parts of the country? And how do wild collections dovetail with these types of tree improvement programs? It's a good question. Yeah, so Melissa, I see that it says that you would like to answer that question. I mean, or is that just... I think that's us in general. <laughs> us in general? Great. Yeah, so on Crown lands in British Columbia, um, there are rules and regulations, and they're put there in place. I know we, we talk about improved uh, seed, but and it is. It's a seed that's being selected. They know that it's you know uh, going to grow uh, faster, stronger, more resistant to uh, the pests of the, that are in that region. But you know the 2 billion tree program, again, um, is aimed at um, planting trees and shrubs that are not currently under provincial guidelines and regulations. So almost all of the public lands in the province of British Columbia and in, in many of the, the province across the country are already deemed you know, under provincial forest regulations. So the 2 billion tree program is really focused on other lands. So uh, private lands, urban centers, lands owned, owned by, you know, indigenous communities, lands owned by conservation groups. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess the, the, the answer to the question is that it, it is a work in progress and the provinces are still working out details with the two billion tree program about how they're going to incorporate. Um, but there definitely is, um, I think, opportunities for synergies within the provincial guidelines and regulations and in the um, overall scope of the tubely entry program. Uh, yeah, and I'll just add to that, that um, because I was out in BC with Tanis recently, um, I mean, BC has a pretty remarkable system for everything from start to finish, and it's exemplary and world class for for advancing, um, you know, tree improvement programs and really supporting them. So in most of the rest of the country, I think that it, that's still coming along. And I know that a lot of people cite most of the resources that have been developed, but it's also critically important in BC because of the elevational differences. So for most of the rest of the country and science that I've followed for a long time, you know, where there's less, uh, where there's more flatter landscapes and across the US, I mean, if you've seen the provisional seed zones, in the US that's are supposed to cover all wild species. Um, there's a pretty clear divide once you get uh, east of the Colorado basin because it just becomes flat and there's not as much differentiation um, and control over sort of the need to uh, to do all that in some cases. But it's, it's definitely, I learned a lot when I was in BC going to some of those conferences and uh, I would definitely recommend anyone that is interested in that there'll be some uh, material coming out through the the tree seed working group is another great group that I help out with um, and have learned a lot from so if anyone wants that well there's some resources that were shared and will be in the FAQ link but um, that's another group that you can kind of learn from what's happening in every province, especially from the, the reforestation policy side of things. Perfect. Keith asks will all trees grown through the 2 billion tree program come from seed processed by the NTSC or will other organizations contribute as well? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And, and the answer is no, not. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> um, you know, we estimate that we'll probably you know, to grow 2 billion trees. You're looking at about 11 billion seed um, and we just don't have that capacity. So what we're offering is, you know, using our, you know, 50 years of experience working with um, you know a wide range of species is knowledge mobilization but then we're also offering you know to certain segments um, including uh, uh, indigenous communities and we're also working a bit with parks canada um, that we will be able to do some uh, of the you know to help with some seed collecting to help with some seed processing testing and short-term storage because we understand that it's going to take time. It might take two to three years for some communities or certain regions of the country to rebuild and reestablish the infrastructure they need, uh, you know, to support the nurseries in the region with the seed collecting from these um, species that are um, not necessarily or haven't necessarily been used in the high demand that they currently are by this program. So that's sort of our role is just sort of to help when we can. Um, we have used dip again our collections were collected for the purpose to support research and educational programs in the country and the world um, but in some cases we have been working with a wide range of nurseries across the country who maybe they don't have experience working with certain species and if we have extra seed for certain species we'll send them to that nursery so they you know they can work with it and see okay um, what do we have to do that seed uh, so that our equipment needs can, you know, support the, uh, the seeding off that seed in our nursery. Um, or maybe it's things like certain species that need certain stratification, you know, breaking dormancy. So a nursery might want just some seed to experiment with and, and do some testing. So that's sort of our role. Yeah. Uh, Lynn asks, how do we assess our geographical area? How do we know it's healthy? Maybe this is more uh, assessing healthy uh, healthy stands to collect from uh, and forecasting. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take a stab at that first. Um, so one of a lot of the guiding documents about how we set targets, like when I shared that black ash, for example, you know, we said we want about one hundred fifty thousand viable seeds. Um, 
divided between 15 to 20 trees for each eco region. Um, we kind of have a, a policy that until we know more about the genetic diversity of a species, we use that as a coarse measure of capturing as much. Um, it, it helps to make sure that we have at least 20 distinct copies uh, of rare genetic traits that we might be able to find with future technology. I mean, it, it's really hard to predict sometimes how much seed we're going to need to hold a collection for 20 years because seeds do decline in storage, even with the best science we have. Um, so there's been a lot of great work um, done, especially the Morton Arboretum. I'll share a link in the chat or with our follow up FAQs from a group called Confergen that was all the provincial geneticists getting together um, to try and cover some of these less common understudied species. Um, but our general rule has sort of been, you know, spacing trees out, making sure that we go to a stand that is is what viable would mean was it you know no more than or no less than 15 to 20 trees that are intermixing genetics with each other but even in bc i know that the the conservation assessments they're looking what they call healthy because of the size of the landscapes they often have you know five thousand trees in a stand is what they consider um you know a really good healthy wild population so depending on where you are and depending on how much forest cover you have, sometimes those targets get to be really hit and miss. In Southern Ontario, where I've lived most of my life, you know, there's a lot of areas that have less than 10% forest cover. So sometimes you're dealing with forest stands that are extremely reduced and the best you can find is a stand with 10 trees. For certain species, they can tolerate some of that genetic bottlenecking, but it's not that healthy long term. So I think that leads really well. There's two Lynn's asking questions. So I think that leads really well into the next question, but um, Bernie or Donnie, do you have anything additional to add to that from your experience with research? No, I think that, I think that's, I think you've answered that and. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, nothing on my, on my end. Okay, uh, another Lynn. A different one is asking, I'm wondering how or if you are incorporating climate change into seed collection scenarios. For example, are you using modeling to determine how seed collection sites may change in the future? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure Melissa is going to want to jump in on this, but uh, Lynn, so that's the importance of knowing where we collect our seed from. So, you know, our forest industry, recreation company industries, you know, they only plant seed knowing where it came from. Um, our horticultural side and our nursery, our private nurseries, that, you know, if you went to a private nursery, you know, any box store and you wanted to pick up a tree, you have no way of knowing where that seed came from that grew into that tree. So you have no idea if it's genetically appropriate for your particular region. Well, as part of the 2 billion tree program, they understand that and they want to follow suit on what our forest industry, you know, has put so much research into and know. So we want to know where all of our seed sources come from. And once we know where the seed sources come from, then we can sort of look and see, okay, the seed was collected from such and such an eco district. Therefore, based on provincial regulations, based on climate change scenarios, that seed should be good for this range of other ecosystems, more than likely to the north. But uh, that's sort of how we go about this. So we definitely are considering climate change but the first part of that is knowing where your seed came from in the first place um yeah melissa uh, yeah i was just going to lean on a lot of great work that i've been following for years from um our great lakes uh, sault saint marie group so dan mckenney and john pedler two scientists that worked on developing the seedware tool so some people might know about trying to match the future, you're trying to match this moving target, um, where if you know the general coordinates of where you got something from, you can look ahead into 30, 60, 90 years in the future. But most um, anyone who's operationalized seed transfer policies right now, um, they aren't looking too far in the future because there's always a risk of, fr of hard frosts and early adaptation um, survival. So Seedware is a tool that I've used for a long time. There's there's similar ones in the States and there's ones being developed um, with all sorts of different um, inputs that you can do. So if you wanna try to match the future annual temperature or the growing season length or if winter frost is a problem, um, that's definitely a topic that could be in its entire own webinar or a whole university series because the science is, is quite complex and it takes some time to learn 
how to run the tools effectively. But if that's something that interests folks, um, that's definitely something where uh, there's either existing webinars, I'll try to find a few just to get you started on how to use Seedware. And there's other um, folks on this line that have probably know of similar things or or have incorporated the system migration and climate change into their into their scenarios. But basically, I think the biggest thing that we're hearing and have heard for about 10 to 15, 20 years is that we really need to emphasize in Canada having a wider portfolio of sources to pull from um, so that planting projects can can select from, you know, not just one single source. And if they don't, if their local source is no longer suitable for the scenario that's coming, um, that they've got options to consider. So, you know, portfolios like your investment strategy, you're not going to have all your eggs in one basket. So, and I know that, uh, Mary, do you want to bring up Sherilyn's question there? Um, so Sherilyn is wondering um, and interested in knowing how we came to the conclusion that black ash was go uh, comes into seed every seven to nine years. Yeah, so it's um, the conclusion is based on the science. And so you're always going to have exceptions. And Bernie uh, alluded to that earlier, how you have, might have a single tree in a population. And a really good example actually is in Nova Scotia. There's a black ash population near Oxford, and there's one tree there that seems to produce seed almost every year, which is really abnormal. But, you know, over 50 years of seed collecting by the National Tree Seed Center, but then looking at other seed centers data um, across the country, um, and it's it sort of uh, bumper crops have been recorded for, you know, the last 50, 60 years. And for black ash, that's just the periodicity of it. It's seven to nine years. Um, again, when you think of black ash, uh, where it grows, it's usually fairly swampy, not really nutrient rich. Um, it takes a lot of energy and resources for our ash to put out a, a good crop of seed. Um, you know, white ash grows in a little bit richer sites and it's actually every, you know, five to six years, four, four to six years. Green ash uh, produces seed almost every year. So again, every species sort of has that, you know, cyc cyclic, um, um, seed production. And again, you will find abnormals, you will find the odd tree based on stress, or, or maybe it's just a genetic anomaly that puts out seed. But for population based seed collecting, that's, that's what the, the data shows. So Sherilyn says, um, yes, literature cites this, but knowledge keepers indicate otherwise. And right. that is why the Indigenous Seed Collection Program, it, 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 you know, that that's part of our program is to, you know, find out what our traditional knowledge keepers know and to add that into our data and how we do things. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. I, I, I think that they see it a little bit more often than what the literature shows. And that's just from observation over doing it for uh, well, 15, 20 years. And I know that we collected on more than two occasions during that period. Mm -hmm. um, and um, an another factor there, it, it could be that, yeah, no, it's, uh, um, they will produce seed in, in different places too. So now I, I, I've, I've seen black ash produce incredible crops uh, of seed, just probably, and, and I regret not taking a picture in 2019 of a site that uh, I was collecting at and you couldn't see the stem for the, the seed that were on those trees. It was just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. So yeah. she's also asking, could it be produced due to stress um, when she's looking at the seed productions being a lot closer together or yearly? S stress could definitely play a factor in, in, in all of the species. Um, um, again, those trees that are grown in like what, what Donnie talked about those lower areas um, the stress there isn't likely going to be lack of moisture as you get higher up you could even see on on a site as, as you move uh, upwards a bit you could get some some differentiation in in how the trees respond um, I remember one year this was quite a few years ago and it, it was another one of those poor uh, seed years, and I hit an area about 
two kilometers along a road that everything was producing seed. And it was just an anomaly. Something happened there the preceding year that caused those trees to, to produce seed. It wasn't what I would call a super heavy crop, but it was a good crop where there was nothing else anywhere else. So something happened very locally that uh, caused some seed to be produced in that, in that one area. It's, um, it's not an exact science. Um, and like... Um, you know the 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 knowledge keepers. We need to 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 learn. It's 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 about an exchange of knowledge and 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 understanding uh, better. Because the indigenous people are are much more keyed in to uh, black ash, Wustuk, than uh, uh, we are. Because it's it's um, it hasn't been on our radar as much. So we uh, definitely need to learn about black ash and other species. Yeah, one comment I would put in there too is that um, a lot of species, including ash, it, visually, it look like the tree is putting out a bumper, a really good seed crop, but the seed a lot of the time, unfortunately, are empty. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, you know, well, the seed center has been working on ash since 2000, 2004, but you know, even the last four years since 2019, we'll receive bags full of ash seed that were collected, but unfortunately a cut test wasn't done in the field and the seed looked perfect, but when you cut them, there's, not, there's nothing in them, they're hollow. So basically the, the, the female tree produced a flower, but it wasn't pollinated, it closed over and it looks fine, um, but there's nothing there. And that, you know, another species I'll definitely mention is beach. There's definitely something going on with our beach in that we've had more beach collections sent to us in the last, you know, five years and there's nothing in the beach seed. So the seed looks intact and we'll get a big bag full of it and it's empty. It's actually been almost 10 years since we've had a really healthy, good beach collection made. Melissa's going, oh, maybe there was one made sometime before then. <laughs> I made a good one last year, actually, with one of the collaborators on the call. So um, we got a good one down in Norfolk last year, but it was it was a uh, it was a fun day. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, but going back to the black ash and um, I know this only because I spent a lot of time researching where that number came from as to like, you know, seven to nine years. That's the upper end. I think if you look in some of the, the resources, um, some of the original observations about black ash came from like with you know wisconsin on the very western edge of its range where it gets really dry and a lot of times at the at the edges of a species range is where the periodicity is marginal so it tends to draw out a bit longer where people notice like a really big crop so the original paper i think that mentioned black ash cropping frequency was like 1954 or 59 or something and then i know that steve dion in the ottawa valley where it's kind of core habitat and same with new brunswick i mean new brunswick the reason why it's probably a very important uh, cultural species to most of the Eastern uh, communities, First Nations, is because it is it is very prolific where we are um, compared to you know Wisconsin in some spots. So um, you know the cropping frequency. I I waited for a long time after I was trained in seed collection to see a crop, but you know in my area where I'm sitting right now um, near Peterborough. You know the stress crop is really evident i went to a couple of trees and, and stands that i had 200 healthy trees that i picked tons of off in 2019 it was probably starting to be a stress crop because eab kind of started really expanding from the city of peterborough um, around 2018 2019 and um and i went back to those same stands there's some seed on the smaller trees but they're all peppered with exit holes so the, the crop is because of eab and it's probably the last chance we'll see um, seed on those stands for quite a while. So, you know, it is on the ecological time span. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that happen interannually. And it is really hard, as Bernie said, to define the statistics of variability over such a wide range. Most of the, you know, citizen science tools and iNaturalist, like those things have only really been well populated with data in the last 10 years. So we don't really have a great sense of what the cropping frequency is across the whole range. So maybe seven to nine years is when the whole range comes into fruition, like 2019 was, but there's always interregional pockets here and there. And, and there's, like, as Donnie said, there's always anomalous trees that, uh, 
that are more precocious than others. So that's usually what breeding programs are also built on. People look for those particular trees to bring into breeding programs because they are precocious. So yeah. that's what I'll say. Thank you very much. That was a very good question discussion. Um, I'm seeing some questions pop up in the chat. Uh, that's great. We'll get through them. If if you did that, if you could put it in the Q and A tab, it helps us keep track of it and make sure that we answer your question. Um, so this one is um, from Gaetan, and they say I have a woodlot that would be open to that I would be open to allow access for people interested in collecting seed. How can I make that happen? I think let us know <laughs> is the best way. We'd love to collect your seed. Yeah, one of the things I'll, I'll say to any of the people uh, on the call, and we say it all the time, is that you know the, the one thing we're missing, it's eyes and ears on the ground. Um, and the more people that are thinking about seed collecting and are aware of you know how what what dictates a healthy population and when maybe seed sh should be collected, um, and then let us know. Um, because we can't be everywhere. So again, for um, for someone to tell us they have a woodlot someplace and it's open for seed collection, that's great. But knowing that there's actually seed to collect and from what species, that makes it, moves it more towards the reality that something would happen. Um, including that, you know, if, you know, as the 2 billion tree program goes on, if you're in an eco district where seed is being asked for by the nurseries and stuff, then that's, you know, something it, you know, I'm not sure it falls under our mandate, but we could definitely do our best to sort of help guide uh, and connect people uh, who are seed collectors to landowners who don't mind having seed collected from those from their properties uh, going forward. So, yeah, I just um, I just emphasize in the chat. I mean, I, I think if if you're working from a professional standpoint, I mean, I think that's a totally different ball game for for managing land professionally and, and permission and access and, and permits that might be required. But if you're a private woodlot owner, you know, a lot of the across the whole country, there's a lot of private woodland associations that are becoming aware of this. And I even had an email with someone today <clears throat> with the Ontario Woodlot Group. So, you know, there's there really is interest in trying to have sort of a common database and <clears throat> make it easy for people to do this. So that's a great um, network to try and maybe prime your local woodlot chapter. Um, into into offering this and getting especially connecting the local networks rebuilding them in some places are really important so and I just also put iNaturalist because it's a great way to just geo reference take a picture of something that's common I mean I wouldn't post endangered species or or your um, you know your lawn specimens per, per se there but uh, that's a, another great resource that helps people especially if you don't know the identification as well so um, can help you with with keying out certain species that are troublesome Perfect. Um, here's a question from Lynn. I'm wondering, do basswood produce seed every year or is there a yearly frequency for them as well as my bees rely on them? And I've noticed that our basswood trees do not seem to be fruiting this year. Again, the literature would say for basswood every two years. Um, so, <laughs> but as we've already had in discussions, the literature isn't always correct. But in general, that's what the literature is saying that, you know, every two years that you would expect bass would to, to come into seed. So if it was in seed last year, then, you know, there is a, a chance that it wouldn't be in seed. Uh, bass would depends on where you're at. I know a lot of urban centers have planted a lot of tilia. Um, and I'm not sure if um, the non-native tilia is a substitute, uh, you know, allowing for pollen for, for bees and, and pollinators or not. Um. I think so. I would, I would say too, that I, I've already noticed this year, cause I was scouting a lot of basswood last year. Last year was a really great basswood crop. And I've seen a few trees that I collected from last year in flower again. So they're, they can actually be semi-annual here and there, but yeah. um, yep. Okay. And um, yeah, I was going to, unless anyone's got any more Questions? Yeah, I don't I don't see yeah. questions. There's a, a couple. There's a shout out I wanted to make um, uh, someone uh, Marika uh, in the chat. Um, we, we know we worked with her in the National Rock Watershed Association. Um, so she's asking if anyone's interested in or involved in restoration of degraded habitats via planting hardwood trees and shrubs. 
uh, she would love to make some connections there. So uh, I'm, we're really loving to see all the connections and emails being swapped back and forth uh, in the chat. This is one of the big goals we had with this webinar series is just connecting people from across the, the land. And I might put one more plug in there. I know there were already two people uh, or two organizations that have sort of put outreach in. Um, if you are an organization and you are interested in any training opportunities, uh, please let Mary or I know. Uh, if, if you're an Indigenous community, let Ma Mary and I know. Uh, if not, you can just uh, send me an email. And again, um, we did receive some funding to help with, uh, you know, with knowledge mobilization. Um, Melissa is currently located in Southern Ontario. So if you're in that part of the country, you know, we can uh, possibly work to have Melissa make a, a site visit. Um, our staff in general is going to be doing the Maritimes and then I'm going to be on a cross Canada uh, trip, August, September and October. So again, if we can fit you in, um, we will. And I think that's that's okay. a wrap. I was gonna let we were gonna let Mary have a chance to chat. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Um, I really want to apologize for not being here and making um, Donnie um, give my presentation, um, but my um, internet went down and they were saying that it wasn't going to come back on until uh, six o'clock at night, but it came back on at a little after two. And so I was a little late getting on. Um, so I just wanted to kind of let you know that um, I'm working with Donnie and um, the rest of the National Tree Seed Center on the Indigenous Tree Seed Collection Program. And the reason I'm so excited about doing this is because of I really believe in it. I really believe that, you know, without seed, we lose too many things. And, and it's not just um, the plant species we're losing, we're losing um, our access to that species once it's gone. We're losing um, our ability to use it traditionally or culturally or to harvest it and, and then teach our youth about it and passing on the language along with the culture and the uses. So it's, it's so vital. Um, I want my daughter and her children's children to have access to the same things that I do. So this is something I really, really believe in. And I want to be able to be there to support you guys and, and push your um, seed collection efforts forward as well. So I'm here for you. I'm here for the National Tree Seed Center. So I'm that joint between the two. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with all of you. It doesn't look like we have um, any more questions coming through. Donnie, if you wanted to have the final word. Final word is have a great summer. And um, this is the time to start getting out and forecasting. Take a look and see what's what's happening out there and start planning. Again, if you weren't, uh, if you didn't see our first three seminars, again, they're all on YouTube. Um, and that information is being provided and, and we thank you for participating.